Hello there. In this lesson, I'd like to talk to you about the Cauchy Riemann conditions. If you like what I do and you'd like to support it, well then Patreon is the best way to do that. So let's begin. Firstly, I'd like to do a quick recap. We know that a complex number has two components, a real component and an imaginary component. We know the building block for the real number line is the square root of plus one, while the building block for the imaginary number line is the square root of minus one. And we can represent an arbitrary complex number as z, which can be expressed in rectangular coordinates as x plus iota times y, or in polar coordinates using Euler's equation here. Now, this is a 2D complex number, so that means it can be represented on an Argand diagram or the infinite complex plane. Now, complex numbers can be rather tricky. So if we have a single real dimension our complex number is actually 2D. But if we have three real dimensions, which happens regularly in science, engineering, and maths, we're going to have a 6D complex number. And this suggests we should move away from representing a complex number in this rectangular fashion, and actually say that a complex number is represented by the function f, which itself is a function of a real function u and an imaginary function v. And each of those are themselves functions of the various dimensions that we have. So in actual fact, this is how we would represent the 2D complex number. Clearly, this gets more involved if you start having higher dimensions. So consider an arbitrary complex number. I'm going to call it Z0 or Z sub 0. And it itself is given as the real component X0 plus iota times the imaginary component Y0. It can be represented on an Argand diagram in this fashion here. And the question posed in the derivation of the cauchy riemann conditions is, is differentiation valid for complex numbers? Now, of course, differentiation is valid for the real numbers, but we don't know if it's actually valid for imaginary numbers. It's not necessarily very clear or obvious. We must recall the definition of a derivative. So let's take a function, arbitrary function, I'm going to call it f. And it's a function of the single variable x. And we're going to take its derivative. Now, of course, it's only a function of a single variable. So it's going to be a total derivative given by a d like this, as opposed to a partial derivative if it was a function, let's say, of x and y, where we would use del. Anyway, in taking a derivative, we must increment the function by an amount which we call delta x and we take f of x plus delta x, we take away from it its original position, which is simply f of x, and divide by the increment delta x. And we take the limit as delta x goes to zero, and this gives us our derivative, or our rate of change. And it is normal or customary to say that f of x is represented by y. So you say that df of x dx is equal to dy dx, and is given by this particular limit here. So consider the Argand diagram we have here, where we have our, our real component x and our imaginary component y. And here is our complex number z. Note that in the most simple terms, there are four directions on the Argand diagram or the infinite complex plane that we can approach the complex number z0. If we were to hold the imaginary component fixed, we could approach z0 from the right or from the left just by varying the real component. Or if we hold the real component fixed, we can approach Z0 from the top or the bottom by varying the imaginary component. Now clearly these are four special circumstances or cases. We can actually approach Z sub zero from any arbitrary direction, but that if we understand the four most important, well, then everything else falls from that. So the question this kind of poses is, is it actually equivalent to approach Z0 from any of these directions? Does it give the same result? So we need to investigate this, but in reality, what we're going to do is we are going to demand that in order for differentiation of complex numbers to make sense, we must demand that approaching Z0 from the imaginary axis or from the real axis 
or for combinations of both always gives the same result. Think about when we take derivatives of real numbers, that if we increment our function by delta x, or actually by negative delta x, the derivative doesn't change, its magnitude doesn't change, but simply the sign or the parity of the derivative changes. So the question we would have with our complex number is, is incrementing by plus or minus delta x the same as incrementing by plus or minus iota delta y? We're going to look at the complex number z0, and we're going to write it using functions as opposed to rectangular coordinates. So we have the sum of the real function u sub 0 and the imaginary function v sub 0. And each of these are functions themselves of x and y, which are the elements or components of the real and imaginary axes. Now we're going to take the derivative of this particular function here. Notice we're varying z, which means we actually have delta z, which is delta x plus iota delta y. And for clarity, I've written the definition of a derivative in one dimension here, where the, va the value we're varying is x. So we take our function f of x, and we increment it by delta x. We take the old function or the original function away from the incremented function and divide by the increment. Now, our function f of z sub 0 or f of z 0 actually is a function of x and y. So we're actually going to increment in both x and y and divide by the increment of delta x, which is simply, or excuse me, delta z, which is delta x plus iota delta y. And that's what we have at the bottom center of your screen. We have our original real function u0 and our original imaginary function v0. We've incremented them. So we've incremented x and y here, here, and here. So what we actually have is this. We have the incremented function u, the real function u. We take away from it the original real function u, and we divide by our increment. We have the original function v and the incremented function v. We take the original from the, the incremented function and divide by the increment. And this is the definition of the derivative of our function f of z0, which is a two-dimensional complex number. Now, remember that we can approach our complex number from many different directions, but the most simple ones are where we fix the imaginary component and approach z0 along the real direction. So that would be doing this, or if we fix the real numbers and we approach or vary along the imaginary direction, we will be approaching like this. And we're going to do the same thing with our derivative. First of all, we are going to approach z0 from the real direction. So we're going to set delta y is equal to 0. So if we have this expression, and everywhere we have delta y, we set it to 0, we get this expression here. And I'll leave it to you, or if you want, you can pause the video. But if you look closely, we actually have these two partial derivatives. We have del u del x plus iota del v del x. Now clearly it's a partial derivative of x because we have delta x in the denominator. And of course we have our function u and function v. So that's why we have del u del x plus iota del v del x. And this is where we've set the imaginary component not to vary, and we've only varied the real component. And now what we do is we approach z0 from the imaginary direction. So we set the real variable, or delta x, to 0. And if we set delta x to 0 from our derivative, we get this expression here. And once again, if you want, you can pause the video. But if you look carefully, you'll see in actual fact that we have this partial derivative. We have negative iota del u del y plus del v del y. Now, note that I've actually moved the iota from the denominator to the numerator because I've multiplied by iota over iota, which is simply 1. So we've seen that if we hold the imaginary component fixed and vary the real, we get this partial or these partial derivatives. And if we set the real component to be fixed and vary the imaginary, we get these set of partial derivatives. Now, in order for the differentiation of a complex number to make any sense, we know that 
the direction in which we approach the complex number shouldn't make any difference. And this basically means that these expressions here must be equal. Said differently, for a unique derivative, we require that the real components and separately the imaginary components of both derivatives are equal. So basically, we're going to set del u del x equal to negative iota del u del y, and we're going to set iota del v del x equal to del v del y. And we have our cauchy riemann conditions. We have that del u del x is equal to del v del y. We have del v del x is negative del u del y. And these are the conditions for a path-independent complex derivative. Note, of course, that our z0 can be any point on the complex plane of our Argand diagram. And that's really it. The last thing I'll say is, where the derivative at z sub 0 exists, we speak of the function f of z being analytic at that point. Or holomorphic is actually a more modern term, but it's the same as analytic. It means we don't have a divide by 0 scenario. Anyway, the point here is that for a path-independent derivative of a complex number, we must have the Cauchy-Riemann conditions to be true. So I hope you enjoyed that. Hope you got a lot out of it. Thanks for watching. Please pass it to your friends and consider supporting me on Patreon.